The anthropocentric view of cognition suggests that cognitive complexity is a uniquely human trait. However, research conducted on a range of animals suggests that this is not the case. There is clear evidence that animals can rapidly solve novel problems, use tools, recognise and deceive individuals and plan for the future. They have sophisticated communication systems and show an understanding of the properties of physical objects, numbers, cause and effect. In this film, scientists discuss examples of their research and the implications for our understanding of animal intelligence. Importantly, the main players, the animals themselves, take centre stage. We've focused on cognition in birds for several reasons. Firstly, they're very widely distributed and people are familiar with them. Secondly, birds have followed an independent evolutionary pathway since they split from the reptiles during the Jurassic period about 150 million years ago. This means that their higher intelligence has developed independently from mammals. Thirdly, we wish to dispel this misconception that birds lack intelligence. In the future, perhaps the phrase bird brain will be complementary rather than derogatory. The New Caledonian Crow research started off really with a chance observation. And I was working in the mirror and saw a crow using a tool in the end of a dead branch. It seemed to be trying to weedle out insects and things. And when it finished doing that, it put the tool in its bill and flew away with it. And it seemed like intelligent behaviour to me. The New Caledonian crows make a range of tools from simple to complex shapes. They incorporate hooks into their tool making, which chimpanzees don't do. They spend a lot of time making their tools and also they look after their tools. They carry them around with them. This is one of the neat hooked twig tools that the crows make. These types of tools come from an elaborate manufacture process. Birds choose a leafy forked twig and they remove one side of the fork. Then they remove the tool for the branch. Then they refine the end, removing small pieces of wood. This seems to be a purposeful process. The end goal is to arrive at a hooked twig tool. And the hook here ends up quite pointed and quite an efficient tool for removing or hooking prey material out of sites. No other non-human animal manufactures hooks or even uses hooks in the wild. We've just seen crows make the hooked twig tool and, and it's an elaborate procedure. Amazingly, they don't just make one type of hook tool, they make two kinds. And the second kind is made out of leaf material. The pandanus leaf is a long, narrow leaf, and it's got natural barbs on the leaf edges. So in the pros in this case, they're using natural hooks on the leaf material. Here we have the second type of hooked tool that the crows are making. And this we call as a stepped design. This is the tool counterpart. This remains on the leaf edge. The shape left on the leaf edge matches the, exactly the shape of the tool that's removed. So we can actually study the tools by looking at the counterparts. And this is a multi-step tool. And we can see it's wide at one end, where the crows hold it in their bill, and it tapers down to a narrow working tip. So they're both are strong and sturdy, but also it enables birds to use a fine tip for fine manipulation. And as we can see, the barbs on the tool run back from the working tip. So the birds are able to use these barbs to hook prey out of sites that they can't get to with their bill. And the birds will use these in pandanus trees where they're made and also outside pandanus trees. So it's more, it's, it's like a multi-use tool, um, the Swiss army knife in their toolkit, if you like. So in this film we can see a crow making a multi-stepped tool out of pandanus leaf. And the bird starts working away from the trunk and it, it first makes the narrow tip and then steps in, cutting in to make the tapered tool. And it will finally cut out the wide end and rip back to remove the tool from the leaf, leaving a nicely shaped counterpart on the leaf edge. And because it's working away from the trunk, the barbs are running back from the working tip, allowing it to be used as a hooked implement to hook prey out of search sites. The major question in animal problem solving is what's going on in their head? Are they solving problems with sort of complex cognition in the way that we might, or are they following sort of simple associative rules? And a standard way of testing that is to use a trap tube. 
uh, apparatus. Food can be moved along here. Food will typically be placed in the middle and you can see on the other side there is a trap. If food is pulled in that direction it will get stuck in the trap and the animal won't be able to get it out. Now what we did in the experiment with crows is systematically remove all the possible associative cues and still uh, our crows are able to solve this task. A feature of human uh, problem solving is not just that we can solve problems, but that we can see parallels, we can see analogies between problems. And this means that our problem solving is, is really quite flexible, it's the heart of our creative problem solving. And we were interested whether crows had similar cognitive abilities. Was it that the crows that had solved the trap tube task could then spontaneously solve a task that was causally similar, but physically very different? And here's what we gave them. We, we presented them with an apparatus a bit like this, that's called a trap table. When we give this to birds that have never been confronted with this task, they, the crows, they typically fail. But the ones that had learned to solve the trap tube task, they were spontaneously able, on the very first trial, able to solve this task. They always went for this side and not for the side of the trap. And what that suggests is that they'd grasp the relevant causal physical principles. Uh, you can only succeed by pulling food along a continuous surface. If you pull it where there's a trap, you will lose the food. So this suggests that crows are not just solving problems with simple associative learning, but can get deeper causal understanding of physical problems. So one of the things we've been really interested in is uh, what's the underlying cognition behind their, their tool use? And one way you can probe that is to see how flexible they are in their use of tools. So what we did was a simple experiment where we asked them not to use tools to get food, but instead to use a tool to get a tool to get food. Alex Taylor did a rather lovely simple experiment where there was a short tool on a piece of string, there was a long tool behind a kind of grill in a cage, and there was some uh, food down a short tube. And to solve this, what the crows needed to do spontaneously was to pull up the piece of string, use the short tool that was on the end of the piece of string, then take that short tool to get the long tool, and then take the long tool to get the food. And what Alice's experiment showed is that some of the birds were spontaneously able to solve that task. And that's really quite amazing because first it showed that the birds did understand that they needed the short stick to get the long stick, and then the long stick could be used to get the food. So they understand the causal processes. And the second amazing thing is the degree of inhibitory control they showed in doing that. Because when they initially get the short stick, the temptation would be, sticks get your food, there's some food. But instead of racing over to try and get the, the food out with the short tool, what they do instead is go and laboriously extract the long tool and then use the long tool to get the food. So it not only shows good causal understanding and ability to plan in a limited way, but also it shows quite good inhibitory control. So the delight, I think, really, of working with these crows is they are capable of making some causal inferences. They are capable of flexible problem solving. And that means that they're a joy and a, and a bit of a challenge to work with. So you've just seen some of the fascinating behaviors that birds are capable of. But they're not only able to manipulate objects in the environment, they're capable of manipulating each other. And I'd like to use an example, this humble species here, the chicken, to show you what I mean. Now chickens have very complex communication. When a male finds a piece of food in the presence of a female, he does this whole display for her because females actually prefer to mate with males that find more food. I'll give you an example. Listen and watch what he does, and watch her reaction off to the right-hand side of the screen. So there's the food, and sees staccato sounds. He picks up, drops the piece of food, but he doesn't eat it. He's waiting to give it to her. And watch her. Look how intently she is watching him. And she'll actually remember him. And in the future, she will prefer to mate with him. So it's very important in the chicken society to be the one that gives her food. And it would be quite easy if it was just the two of them, but it's not. In the chicken world, there's a whole group. There's dominant males, dominant females, and subordinates. When a dominant male 
finds a piece of food, he does that display that you just heard. And you see the hens come running. But the subordinate hen, she hangs back because there's aggression between the females because they want only access to that male. And look off to the right-hand side of the screen. You'll see that subordinate. He has no chance to get close to the females and no chance to get to the food. So what is he going to do? He's going to be sneaky. So if you see here, the male towards the tree trunk in the back, he's about to find a piece of food. And the alpha male's in the foreground with his two favorite hens. Watch what the subordinate does when he finds the piece of food. You see, he picks it up and drops it, but he doesn't make a sound. The female comes over, takes the piece of food, and she invites him to mate. And the subordinate has just successfully mated. He's passed on his genes to the next generation. So what is the alpha to do? The best thing he can do is try and reestablish his relationship with that female by doing a display called waltzing. Later on, he'll actually go and punish the subordinate. But it's not all about food, and it's not all about mating. There are other events in the environment that are equally important, like predators. And it's also important to know how to respond to the event. An aerial predator requires quite a different escape strategy than a terrestrial predator. And the birds are very good at communicating the type of predator that's there so that they let the females know how they should react. So this is an example of a male responding to a typical terrestrial predator. You hear that staccato sound? Those pulses, they're very easy to localize. And when the other group members hear it, they know exactly what to do. They look for a predator on the ground. And interestingly enough, if you ask a person to make a sound like a chicken, they'll make this sound. In the beginning, they see us as terrestrial predators, but eventually, they may see us as friends. You'll be treated to some nice, quiet contact calls. But another kind of predator that's very important, and actually more dangerous than the terrestrial predator, is an aerial predator. So watch and listen to how different this male's response is. So you hear that sound, it's very tonal. It's very hard for the predator to localize, but it's very easy for the group mates to hear and to know exactly what to do. They look up to the sky and or, or they run for cover. And watch again, notice what the male's body posture is. So if you watch, he crouches down, he rolls his eye up and looks to the sky with his left eye. And that's because chickens have a lateralized brain. And that means they can do two different things at the same time. With the left eye, they can watch for predators. And with the right eye, they can actually keep an eye out on their mates and their rivals. It's amazing what these birds' brains can do. And it's very different from the way that mammal brains are. But the capabilities are quite similar. So chickens have a wonderfully complex communication. They have very rich social lives, and they're very capable of doing sophisticated communication, capable of taking the perspective of another animal in ways that we never thought possible. <laughs>